In Narnia, he doesn't tell us what he's up to. And if he had disclosed the secret, it would have you know, frustrated the very thing he was trying to achieve. But it table. would have been a perfect answer to Tolkien. Yeah. But then I think Lewis didn't really much care what, the, what Tolkien thought. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Michael. Honor and pleasure to have you here. Honor and pleasure to have you teach regularly at Hillsdale College. Uh, thank you for the many benefits you've done me. Uh, you don't want to, but we're going to begin by talking about you a bit. I've given you a strong reason why that's a good idea, mostly so people can learn how you became this thing that you are. And then we'll talk about your work. Uh, you're born in West Sussex, Southern England. Uh, you spent, by my count, 18 years in graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. What's that about? Well, uh, I'm a slow learner. I think that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's all there is to that. I think it must be that you loved it. True? True, yeah. yeah. I say of myself an excuse that you do not have, being a Catholic priest, uh, I would still be a graduate student, except my wife got pregnant. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't practical <laughs> anymore. But uh, what better life? Now today, uh, we both live partially the life of the graduate student and get paid for it. That's not too bad. Um, uh, you studied uh, English literature and theology mm -hmm. in the main. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think your work shows the mark of both those things, especially the first, because it's not so obvious? Yeah, I, I hope so. I remember I, I had a. I'm not. I'm not given to moments of uh, you know hearing the voice of the Lord, but I distinctly recall when I was about 14 and wondering about my future, worrying about my future, which way I was going to go, because I had these two great passions: English and theology. And I was praying in church, saying, Dear Lord, show me which way I should go. And the, the voice of the Lord came to me saying, Go both ways. <laughs> <laughs> you can ride two horses abreast. Yeah. And so it has turned out. So I did my first degree in English, second degree in theology, and then my PhD was technically in theology, but it was very literary. I was studying C.S. Lewis's imagination. The, uh, it, it came to me, and I, I've known you a long time, but uh, I learn more all the time. And I was reading Planet Narnia, and I was reading the, the section on the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And I suddenly looked up and I said, this guy studied English. <laughs> and I went and looked it up. And I recognized the marks because they're obvious. Everybody, by the way, should read that book. Uh, my great teacher, one of my two great teachers in life, is a man named Harry Jaffa, and he studied English literature in undergraduate school at Yale, and it never left him. Mm. And he never he taught many courses on Shakespeare that I took, and they were consistently excellent. He wasn't always a consistently excellent teacher on any day, although he was very profound. Anyway, I just thought he was just captivated by that, mm. and I think you never got over it. Mm. Um, you became a chaplain. And you've done a lot of teaching. What do you learn from those things? Golly. Yeah, I became a chaplain <coughs> at Peterhouse in Cambridge. And then I uh, had another chaplaincy position at St. Peter's in Oxford. Um, and yeah, j during those chaplaincy years, I was also doing bits of uh, teaching on C.S. Lewis and theological imagination. And... Um, I suppose the main thing I learned is going back and forth between the, the sort of the, the chapel and the study or the chapel and the lecture room is what I learned. You know, the, the back and forth between the theoretical and the practical or the, you know, the, the bookworm and the, and the worshipper. You know, you've got, the two have got to be in conversation with each other. And that dialogue is, well, that's one of the things I'd say about you know, riding two horses abreast. I think I would be a bit bored if it was just one. Mm. But uh, the mm. the alternation, the pendulum swinging back and forth between the two disciplines, is is always generative of new ideas in the study and new uh, insights. Hopefully, uh, in the Christian life. Mm. That may be because uh, 
things are so connected that the disciplines themselves may be artificial. Mm. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, what's the point of cutting up knowledge into these departments? It's it's mostly done for purposes of bureaucratic convenience, or so that people know where their careers begin and end. But it doesn't really mean much. No, and our our own limits too. Mm. Uh, uh, you have a gift of focus that we're going to talk about today. Uh, I was taught by Harry Jaffa was one of my teachers to focus, and Martin Gilbert, the other one big one, who wrote 85 big books of history, there's an amazing consistency in what he wrote them about. And you have given your life to C.S. Lewis, and that means you can go deep. Mm. Uh, but also, literature and theology do not exhaust all high knowledge. Mm. And so, you have to know something well. And you've chosen to know two things well, and that's good. It leads to a lot of other things. And it doesn't actually exhaust C.S. Lewis either, because you know Lewis knew many more things than I will ever know. Uh, and in addition to literature and theology, in his case, he also had a background in classics and in philosophy. Hmm. But I'm no classicist, and I'm certainly not a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Beware of the man who says either of those things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you do have a strong fundamental education. Seems to me, and so I know a little bit about Aristotle, and it seems to me that you understand that structure of knowledge and the soul pretty well, and you use it adeptly. What, ca what, what kinds of things cause things? What are the operations going on in the soul? I'm going to ask you to distinguish one of them for me. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> you manage that with familiarity. How'd that come to be? Through again, just immersing myself with a focus on, on C.S. Lewis, who, um, as I say, had a great classical background, and his own philosophical leanings were very Aristotelian. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just reading and rereading Lewis and rereading everything about him uh, and his circle, Tolkien and Williams and the Inklings and his forebears. I suppose that just gradually accumulated. I never set out to to acquire this knowledge. I just followed my nose. It's a it's, you know it's a snowballing effect. I never set out to be a Lewis scholar, but I just liked Lewis from an early age. Kept reading him, and voila, I became an expert. It's amazing. <laughs> I can I can disclose a private conversation you had with Professor Whalen, one of my most important colleagues. He was inquiring of you what you would teach around here, which we're very glad that you do. And you would say, you would teach C.S. Lewis, and he would suggest a second thing, and you would say, C.S. Lewis. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I'm a one-trick pony, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Just turns out it's a big trick. <laughs> yeah, it's a big pony. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, you've written two books that are stunning. Uh, one of them is called Planet Narnia. We're going to talk about that one first. So... The Narnia books. Mm. Describe them a little bit. Seven Chronicles of Narnia, written principally for children. Uh, they, Lewis called them fairy tales, but they are, like all great fairy tales, um, full of hidden depths and can be read just as much by adults, perhaps even more enjoyably by adults who see these many of these hidden depths. And yeah, they're set in this imagined land of Narnia uh, where animals talk and all sorts of adventures happen, all the traditional creatures of fable and fairy, giants and dragons and witches and so on and so forth. And it's a world in which, uh, well, as Lewis himself described it, um, sorts of, all sorts of um, religious inhibitions that might paralyze one's spiritual life in the real world can be set aside. You can cast Christianity into this magical world, strip of its stained glass and Sunday school associations, and perhaps for the first time, make it appear in its real potency uh, by allowing people imaginatively to grasp the, the principles and the, and the motions of the spiritual life, uh, divorced from questions of church and doctrine and that sort of thing that might otherwise inhibit you. That was Lewis's sort of moral and Christian aim for the series, but he also was, you know, he was just a good writer, good author, a good imaginer, and he wanted to write a good rollicking tale that would, would capture the imagination. He published them in the 1950s, and they're still selling in their millions, 
translated now into 40 odd languages. Uh, they've been adapted for stage and screen. Um, and they've become classic works. You know, they've entered the canon of English children's fiction. And justifiably so. And it's not just Christians who read them either. They've entered the mainstream. Uh, and there's a lot going on in these books. So there's a mixed reception from some people that Lewis respected deeply, friends, about that. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's that about? Yeah, he read the first few chapters of the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, to his friend Tolkien. And Tolkien didn't much like what he was hearing. Mm. Tolkien thought the books had been thrown together a bit haphazardly. Uh, if you know Tolkien's Middle Earth... That's a very different kind of imagined space. It's very rigorous and thoroughgoing, and it has what he called the inner consistency of reality. Narnia, by contrast, looks a little bit slapdash. Things drawn together from all sorts of different mythological literary traditions. The classics and fairy tale and E. e Nesbitt sort of Edwardian stories and uh, Father Christmas is in there, and Tolkien didn't like it. And because Tolkien has become famous, uh, his attitude to Narnia has become famous. And lots of people have sort of followed in Tolkien's wake and thought that Tolkien knew the series much better than he actually did. And so they've sort of jumped on the bandwagon and thought, oh, yeah, Narnia's not very good. Is it? It's just thrown together in an afternoon. And um, it shouldn't be taken very seriously. But I think that's entirely wrong. Yeah. Uh, why? <laughs> well, because Lewis was not a random or a slapdash writer or thinker. You know, he had one of the most disciplined and trained and controlled intellects of the 20th century. He didn't do anything uh, casually or thoughtlessly. Um, so Narnia... But that sorry. argument won't quite do, though, because Tolkien knew Lewis mm -hmm. as a friend mm -hmm. for decades. And so the fact that Lewis was or was not like that, does not prove about this book. True. I'm leading you to the assertion that you have proved about the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, as I say, Tolkien dismissed the books quite quickly. You know, he only read or had read to him the first few chapters of the first book, and he, you know, he threw up his hands in horror and turned away. And he was a hard man to please, Tolkien. He disliked nearly everything that Lewis wrote, actually. Um, whereas Lewis, in contrast, loved The Lord of the Rings and badgered Tolkien endlessly to finish it. Um, so it was a love-hate relationship they had. Lewis loved Tolkien's works, and Tolkien hated Lewis's work. <laughs> <laughs> That's an uh, odd basis for a friendship, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> well, they, they were in some ways chalk and cheese. Um, but, you know, opposites attract. Anyway, the, the, the Narnia books are are not casually thrown together. They are, they are structured, I believe. This is the discovery I made when I was doing my doctoral research on Lewis's imagination. They're structured according to the seven heavens, the seven planets of medieval cosmology, which Lewis, as a medieval scholar, knew all about, and which he described as spiritual symbols of permanent value, which were especially worthwhile in his own generation. And it's those seven heavens from which we get the names of the days of the week. So the sun, the moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. These seven planets with their seven sets of attributes and qualities and influences. That's what provided Lewis with his scheme, his blueprint, his, his imaginative design. Now we're going to explore that at length. But before we do... You make an amazing statement, uh, which apparently is true, in your book. Uh, Lewis hid that fact. Mm. Why would he do that? Well, he wrote a lot about the planets in other works. He wrote about them academically in his book, The Discarded Image, you know, tracing them historically through literature and art. He wrote about them very explicitly in his trilogy of planetary adventures, sometimes called the Space Trilogy, but that's a mistake. It's mm -hmm. better to call it the, the Ransom Trilogy. And, you know, uh, there the seven heavens are, are used very obviously. He wrote about them too in his poetry. But 
he thought that the best way to understand the planets, their qualities, their attributes, their personalities, was was not through laboriously listing all their all their particular uh, qualities, but by seizing them in an intuition, like you might smell a rose or taste a wine and immediately recognize it. That's the best way of knowing it, these planetary personalities. And so in Narnia, he doesn't tell us what he's up to. And if he had disclosed the secret, it would have you know, frustrated the very thing he was trying to achieve. So that's why it was underhand, as it were, under but the But it table. would have been a perfect answer to Tolkien, right? Yeah. But then I think Lewis didn't really much care what, the, what Tolkien thought. If, you know... Because, <laughs> <Not on. laughs> you know, that there you go again, Tollers, would be the sort of response, I think. And in any case, you know, an artist who has to explain his art mm -hmm. in order for it to, you know, be uh, judged worthy um, has failed. So I don't think Lewis would have felt under any, uh, he wouldn't have felt incumbent upon him to explain himself. You know, if, if it's not if it's not Tolkien's uh, pigeon, it's not Tolkien's pigeon. The not, that's a that's a wonderful point, by the way. Never thought of that. Uh, the the novelist Mark Helperin has produced a little book, which I think he's never published, and it's about conservatism. He says, I think that's the title, and it begins. I think that maybe all he's written. There's a painting of Winslow Homer, the Reaper, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. It's a man with a sickle in his hand, standing before a partially failed field of grain. Mm -hmm. And it's about the First World War. Mm. And uh, Winslow Homer never explains that. Mm. And then he puts over here on the opposite page, both are very well-reproduced paintings, an abstract art. And it means nothing without an explanation. Mm. And that's his point. His, yeah. his point is art has to represent something. Um, so good. Okay, that's good. That's a great point. And but I will tell you that I myself have always loved the, the Narnia novels. I mm. read them to my our children. Mm. But uh, I always thought that they were light, mm. and that means that Tolkien distorted me, and it took a long time for you to help me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I love the fact you just mentioned the, the First World War and the sickle, because in that very line I just quoted about these heavens being spiritual symbols of permanent value, which were especially worthwhile in our own generation. It, he, he, Lewis goes on to say his own generation was, of course, the generation that went through the First World War. You know, Lewis and Tolkien both fought in the trenches of France. And Lewis adds, of Saturn, we know more than enough, but who does not need to be reminded of, of Jove, of Jupiter? So Saturn is often depicted with a sickle or a scythe. Mm -hmm. He's associated with death and disaster. And Lewis sometimes referred to the culture of the 1920s and 30s as Saturnocentric, fixated upon these qualities of death and disaster and despair and bleakness, a very natural response to the First World War. Uh, where, you know, men had been scythed down left and right. Lewis himself had been very nearly killed in the trenches in 1918. But this is one of the reasons why Lewis loved the seven heavens so much, because if you're inclined to think that Saturn is the only or the best way of symbolizing spiritual reality, think again, because there are another six ways of doing it. And the best of them is actually Jupiter, Jove. He's the king. He's the magnanimous, tranquil, festive symbol. And so I think a also lot of a laughing figure. Yeah, jovial, yeah. Um, festive, red voiced and jolly. Lewis in his university lectures like to say those born under Jupiter are apt to be loud voiced and red faced and jolly. And then he would pause and add, it is obvious under which planet I was born. Because <laughs> uh, he was, he was he had a great florid face and a beefy frame and a, a bullish laugh. And um, lots of his friends described him as jovial not necessarily realizing the particular planetary connotation that that had for him. Mm. So uh, in a lot of his works, he's trying to rehabilitate the jovial archetype, this idea of the festive, prosperous, tranquil king, because uh, Jupiter is, above all things, regal and monarchical. 
And uh, so when he came to write The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he structures that whole fable out of this jovial imagery. <laughs> and then he does it another you know, six times with the other six symbols. The last one is the sad one, mm. and that's Saturn. Mm. Uh, isn't that too bad? Children's story ends tragically. Well, it's a bold move, I agree, to kill off literally every character <laughs> and destroy the world that you've just spent the previous six books creating. Um, the amazing thing is that he manages to pull it off as well as he does. Um, and I remember as a boy being terrified by the last battle, especially when this demon, Tash, comes in um, and all the children get killed in a train wreck. But... Though Saturn, as it were, swings his scythe over the whole of the Narnian universe, uh, it's not the last word because uh, the wisdom that dominates the stars, as Lewis puts it, is not that of Saturn but that of Jupiter. Hmm. So there's this lovely moment after, the, after everyone's died and been resurrected where one of the characters, Lucy, says to a friend, uh, have you noticed you can't feel afraid anymore? And the reply comes back, by Jove, you can't. <laughs> and that's just uh, Lewis, you know, with a nod and a wink to the, to the well-educated reader, um, tipping his hand, as it were. By Jove, you, can't, can, you can no longer feel afraid because Jupiter has, as it were, regained his happy seat. And Saturn, having done his worst, has shown himself to be, you know, defeatable. Yeah, wonderful. There's, uh, in which of the novels is it that, Reapy cheap goes over the wave, and, mm. and that's going to heaven, I think. Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Yeah, yeah that's uh, so. That's not uh, the end of the of the last novel. The last battle is not the only time that happens. No, nope. there are glimpses into the heaven, the Aslan's country, in in several of the books. Yeah, yeah. Are awesome. Hey, it's Scott Bertram, and I want to tell you about something new from Hillsdale College. It's the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. If you want to come close to stepping inside a Hillsdale College classroom, well, the Hillsdale College Podcast Network is for you. Get informed and get entertained at podcast.hillsdale.edu. So uh, you mentioned the discarded image, which is a very powerful thing. I urge everyone to read it after he's read these two books by Michael Ward. And it's beautiful. And... Uh, it is a kind of an explanation of Aristotle's metaphysics. Uh, it, uh, I conceive that Aristotle's thought begins with the first line of the Nicomachean Ethics it, in the exactly parallel first line of, of the politics. He turns that into community, all human relations. But when you march through the metaphysics, you're going toward God. Mm -hmm. And God is the top. Uh, top is not exactly the right image. Mm. Uh, of the universe. God doesn't move, uh, or is not moved, that's a better way to put it. The planets move in relation to God, and they move us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Lewis describes that image mm. with some changes in the discarded image, and that seemed to compel him uh, and you say his awesome series of books is built around it. Mm -hmm. Others explicitly, this one not. Mm. Uh, what is the power? To ex explain why that image is powerful. Well, I think it was powerful for Lewis because he was a medievalist and he had this great love, especially for Dante uh, and the Paradiso where the pilgrim mounts up through these seven heavens in his ascent to God's throne in order to enjoy the beatific vision. Um, and Lewis loved Dante. He described the Paradiso as the highest point that poetry had ever reached. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another reason, you know. He didn't write a lot about Dante. Not Well, no full-length books or treatments, but he wrote a couple, or a couple of essays uh, and lots of scattered comments. Um, and he thought this idea of the of the seven heavens, the, these crystalline spheres rotating around the home of God like moths to a flame, was a beautiful image of human desire for 
the divine, for the transcendent. It's what in his autobiography he calls joy, these stabs of longing, this Zenzuk, as the German romantics call it. And he thought that was a, you know, an important picture, an important uh, one side at least of the, of the spiritual life. But it was, not, it was, all, was only one side. And the other side is, of course, f- from the New Testament, you have the idea of, of God not as the, you know, the, the sedentary center around whom everybody turns, but rather as the good shepherd who leaves heaven and comes to earth to search out for the lost sheep. Um, which is an entirely opposite way of, of conceiving of, of this reality. And the two need to be held in tension. They, they, they're two sides of the same coin. The, uh, Lewis calls this the model. Mm-hmm. And he says he loves the model. But it's only a model. Mm. Conceived by minds that are beyond models. So it's like a favor these wise people did us to give us an image. Mm. But we're not to believe it's the final truth, I think he's saying. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he's got a very interesting epilogue at the end of the discarded image where he, he says to the reader, you know, I've spent all this time expatiating upon this uh, old cosmology, the uh, geocentric cosmology, the earth-centered cosmology, and my readers will be desperate, begging me to to admit that it's not true. I admit it's not true, he says. <laughs> and I, I'm not attempting to uh, take us back to that pre-Copernican model. All I'm doing, he says, is trying to enter considerations by means of which we, we respect all cosmological models, idolizing none of them. So, yeah, the pre-Copernican model, the Newtonian model, the Einsteinian model, they all have certain things going for them, but none of them is an, uh, exhausts all that could be said. And one of the problems, actually, uh, with, with the whole Galilean um, controversy was that Galileo, it seems, did say, this is how it is. He, he didn't really admit that what he was proposing was a, was a model, just a way of of saving the appearances, but he rather insisted, no, th- this is, in fact, how things are. And that was, that was one of the major problems with Galileo. Um, he, he didn't just have a new theory. He had a, a new theory of theory. You know, that this, this is not just a means of saving the appearances, but this is actually the last word. And that's basically idolatry. And that was one of the major reasons why Galileo got in such problems. Yeah, if uh, and I, you know, I, I'm coming to the end of my knowledge about astrophysics, but uh, uh, there are corrections to Galileo since mm. those days, right? Yeah. Um, uh, a thing I love about the uh, discarded image is that uh, Lewis corrects some some accounts, contemporary accounts to his time and ours of the older world, and that is one. People thought for a long time the Earth was flat, mm-hmm. whereas his point was it's been a very long time since anybody thought that. Mm. Uh, the second, and see, that is a conceit that's part of our dismissal of the past. Mm. But the second thing is, uh, in the model, the Earth is not the center of the universe; it's the bottom of the universe, and we're looking up at a massive structure, and mm. we're the lowest thing in it. And, of course, that's not pride asserting itself. It's humility and awe. That just seems to me like one of the most powerful points in the book. It, uh, uh, do, you, do you think his work is meant to demonstrate that? I'll define it a little more. Demonstrate the fact that our greatness is in our perception of greatness and thereby our service to it. It's not ever fully to constitute greatness. Yeah. Lewis talks about uh, Pascal, who was terrified by, by the immensity of, the, of those uh, eternal spaces, you know, that separate the worlds. Um, but... Lewis points out it was it was Pascal's own greatness that allowed him to be terrified. <laughs> 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 he, 
you know, a, a, a cat looking up at the sky would not be terrified. Uh, so, absolutely. <clears throat> the, the perceiver uh, is, um, well, obviously, ir irreducibly significant in this equation. I think Lewis is yes he's 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 advancing a kind of hum, a, 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 a humble attitude to all these questions and the idolatry question I think is really interesting. Um, my idea of God is not a divine idea, Lewis says when he's speaking theologically, and no model of the cosmos can get in all the facts. Uh, and insofar as we assume that it does get in all the facts, we're committing idolatry, and then the true God in mercy shatters that idol because he's the great iconoclast. Mm -hmm. He'll have no rival. Um, and that's why we must hold all our cosmological and all our scientific knowledge, all our knowledge full stop, including theological knowledge, with a due provisionality and not mistake our knowledge for the thing known. That's beautiful. I want to talk about imagination for a minute. Like many people, I don't fully understand what it is. Uh, in, the, in the classics, there are two main accounts of the soul that I know of. One, a three-part thing, uh, reason, spirit, and passion. And one, a two-part thing with subdivisions. One, uh, the two-part thing is, no, three parts. Appetite, this is in Aristotle, uh, passion, and reason divided into two subparts by what reason knows. These are all counts of an immaterial soul. How can it have parts? But they, I like to say in class, it's like you go in a butcher shop and they have an outline of a cow and they carve up where mm. the bits of meat come from. <laughs> <laughs> the soul it's all cow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how does imagination work? What is it? How does it work in that? How does it relate to those divisions? Probably. Uh, well, according to Lewis, imagination is the organ of meaning. Uh, and that means that the imagination differentiates between the nonsensical and the meaningful. And that's all it does. Uh, it's not interested in questions of truth or falsity. It's just interested in questions of meaning. And it's reason that, for Lewis, is the natural organ of truth. Reason comes down, as it were, and investigates these imaginative findings, these meaningful images, propositions, whatever they may be, that imagination has supplied. And then reason adjudicates whether they're true, false, good, bad, ugly, beautiful. Uh, reason can't do anything without imagination. But that's a very interesting uh, structure, taxonomy, and one that runs counter to a lot of our presuppositions. Because uh, uh, I'm always telling my students, don't think of the imaginative people as artists and dreamers and novelists and musicians and painters, as opposed to all these rational people who are the scientists and the hard-headed mathematicians and engineers and people like that. No, no, no. Both sets of people are imaginative. It's just they work with different kinds of meanings. Mm. And the scientists and the mathematicians work principally with meanings provided by number and quantity. You know, maths is the basis of modern science. Whereas the artists, the dreamers, the painters, the musicians, they operate with meanings provided by more nebulous meanings. Uh, uh, you know, personalities, qualities, not quantities colors, movements, gestures. Um, but both groups of people are fundamentally imaginative. And it's a disastrous uh, bifurcation or you know division between the two to think that one is not imaginative. No, no, no. Of course they're imaginative because the reason can't operate without imagination. Hmm. Huh. So uh, myth is important to Lewis. Is it connected to imagination? Why is it important? What is it? <laughs> Larry, you're asking me a really difficult question. I thought this was just going to be a nice fireside chat. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to know. <laughs> uh, well, myth. Golly. Um, what should we say about that? It was a fundamentally important aspect for Lewis's Christian conversion, actually, because he'd grown up loving pagan myths 
myths of dying and rising gods. Stories of uh, people like Adonis and Bacchus and Balder and all these pagan deities who die and go down into the underworld and whose death somehow achieves something back here on earth in the coming of spring or the new life in the crops or the coming of daybreak. And Lewis had always found those to be, he said, profound, suggestive of meanings beyond his grasp. He couldn't say in cold prose what they meant, but then he didn't want to. Whereas with Christianity, you had a story of a, an allegedly dying and rising God. Um, and Lewis, with Christianity, was fixated upon trying to explain it in terms of doctrines, sanctification, propitiation, all, all these theological terms that sort of turn the story of Christ into a system of thought. Now, Tolkien and another friend called Dyson said to Lewis, you're putting the cart before the horse. You're letting the tail wag the dog if you're thinking of Christianity principally in terms of doctrines and after-the-fact conceptualizations. No, no, no. Doctrines, theological formulations are important, but they're secondary. They are just means of, as it were, analyzing the more primary language, which is the lived language, of a real man in a real place in real time doing real things. Jesus of Nazareth, crucified under Pontius Pilate outside Jerusalem in about AD 33. Uh, that's what Christianity means in its fundamental um, mode. It means, it means a myth. It's, that is to say, a, a story, a drama with characters and events. But in this case, it's historical. It's the true myth. It's where, it's where the dying and rising God has entered history. And when Lewis realized he'd been getting things back to front, uh, everything suddenly clicked into place for him. And a few weeks after his conversation with these, these two friends, Tolkien and Dyson, he, he finally passed over into accepting Christianity. Mm -hmm. It was the true myth. Here we see the real basis for the friendship. Yeah. Not liking or disliking each other's work. True, yeah. So that's brilliant. Um, uh, we're going to turn now to your second book, and to The Abolition of Man, about which it mostly is, I, I read uh, Abolition of Man first in graduate school in a course taught by an avowed nihilist. Hmm. I always thought that was ironic. He was a great teacher. His name was Harry Newman. And, uh, but he, you could never get him to say it was ironic. If, if, he, if you ask him how he was, he always said 50-50 because mm -hmm. otherwise it would be some commitment about meaning. <laughs> <laughs> but he... Uh, started one of his best courses by reading that book, which is a tour de force, and he loved it, he said, and I loved it, because it is a march through where things are going, mm. the abolition of man. Now, you want to talk about the Tao, and uh, we're going to try to do two things in the time that remains. One is explain what the book is about and how it proceeds and talk about why the Tao is introduced and called that in the book. Is that fair? That's fair. Good. Okay, so go in whatever order you want. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, The Abolition of Man is a book about objective value. Is value real? Is it substantial? Is it out there in the universe? Or is it just something that we project from our own subjective passions and whims and preferences and appetites? And Lewis is arguing that value is objective, and it's something we discover. It's not something we make up. And one of the ways in which he tries to present this idea is by, by showing the remarkable commonality that there is uh, in different human traditions and cultures and civilizations. So he doesn't reach immediately for an obviously Christian term like natural law, as he might have done, because I think that would, in his view, have, have just seemed too obvious and too immediately Christian and therefore might have got people's hackles up. And what he's arguing for is something actually deeper than, than that. He's, he's arguing for something which is fundamental to all human beings, whether they're Christian or not. Namely, conscience, our ability to perceive good and evil and know the one from the other. And that's why he reaches for this Chinese term the, from the philosophy of Confucius, the Tao or the Tao, uh, T-A-O, uh, which is the way, uh, according to Confucius. It's the way the universe goes on. Uh, and, and all 
men who want to live upright lives must conform their steps to this way. Uh, they must tread this cosmic progression in, in imitation of, of things that are real and out there in the universe. Um, so it's a rather cunning move on Lewis's part to reach for a, a Chinese term while all the way, all the time. Um, of course, the way is, is another term for Christianity, <laughs> you know, the followers of the way. And the, in the Acts of the Apostles, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, so even as he's sort of de-Christifying his argument, he's re su subtly and secretly re-Christifying. It's, it's a very ingenious uh, rhetorical strategy. Um, anyway, so he goes on to, to you know, advance all sorts of defenses for the objectivity of value. And then in the final chapter, of the third of three chapters, he, he predicts where we will end up if we give up on objective value. And he says, we'll, we'll effectively demolish ourselves. We'll destroy ourselves as a species. And that's why he calls the book The Explain Abolition of Explain that. Man. How do we go about doing that? How do we explain, destroy ourselves as a species? Well, it's, it's quite a difficult uh, thing to achieve, actually, because the Tao, the conscience, is so deeply embedded in all of us that even as we try to escape it, we, we just find ourselves uh, willy-nilly um, relying on certain aspects of it, one or two shreds of the Tao that we've retained. Um, Lewis here is sort of channeling G.K. Chesterton, who, who says that, you know, um, madmen are, are those who have fixated upon one particular idea to the exclusion of all the others. Because um, to, to try to live absolutely without belief in objective value is almost impossible. The, and those who do it most effectively are in either lunatic asylums or in prison. So I, I have a suggestion to make about this particular point, which I think, you know, who am I? I haven't written a book about it. I teach it, the book sometimes. I think the argument com culminates in a simple point. If you remove from the universe all value then you destroy in the human being its unique ability to prefer the valuable thing over the immediate thing. Mm -hmm. In other words, you turn the human being into a dog or any other beast. And that means that in conquering nature, conquering nature means destroying that sense of value mm -hmm. that otherwise compels us, all you can do is turn yourself into a beast. You have abolished man or you are living as you title your book after humanity mm -hmm. and that i testify now uh i think my life of work has come to be this uh we need to recover the idea that things are real because all philosophy the administrative state all of that what it wants to teach us is that nothing is real mm. except what we tell you is real mm. And uh, that's a great corrective. Now, talking about what is real in this book, this device of the of the Tao or the Tao, he gives a list of moral codes of many cultures, mm -hmm. and explain the bearing of that a little bit. Yeah, well, he um, he says that the Tao is um, self evident. You can't argue to it, you must argue from it. So this appendix that he has at the back of the book where he lists eight different moral laws, duty of special beneficence, duty of general beneficence, duty of veracity, duty to children and posterity, duty to ancestors and parents, and various others. <coughs> he says, uh, he, he uh, illustrates how all those laws are to be found respected in any number of cultures and civilizations he you know he, and he cites various uh, texts from you know native american to ancient babylonian to aboriginal australian to J jewish christian uh, humanist all in support of these various laws which gives a remarkably um, unanimous testimony to the objective reality of the Tao. But he says even absolutely unanimous testimony would not prove it to anybody who wanted to deny it because it, it, can't, it can't be proved. 
it's, it's the basis on which all moral proofs rest. It's the sine qua non. It's, uh, it's ground zero. And you, you can't argue to it. You've got to argue from it. It's, mm. it's the thing that we inhabit. We are already inside the Tao. We don't choose to, to erect it around ourselves. We, we find ourselves inside it. Um, but looking at all these cultures and civilizations is, is a remarkable way, of, is, is a way of reminding ourselves that, oh yeah, it does exist. <laughs> so I want to explore. See, I, I think, by the way, this structure of work that you've produced is a very valuable thing. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, I want to close by saying, uh, how does all this relate to Christianity? Does it help one understand it? Does it lead one to it? Is it the same thing as it? Excellent question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is one of the things I like to uh, pull out of The Abolition of Man because it's Lewis's most philosophical work. And he says at one point that though I am myself a theist and indeed a Christian, I am not attempting here any even indirect argument uh, for Christianity because it's, a, it's purely philosophical. This is, this is humanism in the best sense. Uh, you know, this is God creating all humans in his image, whether they turn out to be Jews, Christians, or whatever. Um, okay. But what is it that is the real crit critical test of objective value? Lewis repeatedly says it's the willingness to suffer for the objectively good. And un unless we're willing to pay a price... We don't actually believe in the objectivity of this thing. Because if, if as soon as things become inconvenient, we change our values so that we don't have to suffer, then we clearly don't really believe in the objectivity of the thing that we claimed to have believed in. Um, we're up objective up to a point, and as soon as it costs us, we shuffle away from it. So Lewis keeps coming back to this idea of Suffering from a good for a good cause. Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. It's sweet and fitting to die for one's country. So there's one value, a patriotic sentiment. Um, but interestingly, he also slips in at one point. A greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Uh, Jesus' his own command. And Jesus himself turns out to be the ultimate example of someone who's willing to sacrifice himself for the objectively good. You know, the, the prime martyr. He didn't want to have to drink the cup of suffering. You know, if, if only this could be taken away, he would have been happy. But not my will, but thine. So there you've got a, a prime example in the scriptures of the recognition of objective value. The Father's will cannot be dodged. It cannot be squirmed out of. Uh, and if you try to, then you've given up on objective value. You, you think you're making it up yourself. And then you're lost. So that's why that's how the abolition of man's argument really uh, dovetails with Christianity, with sacrifice, with suffering, with with tears. And I end my guide, the after humanity guide, by talking about how you know uh, in the in the appendix where he's listing all these the, these various values and laws. Uh, one of the sources that he cites uh, is from Juvenal who says that nature has given us the, the, the best power, the power to, to weep. <laughs> and unless we weep, we're made of stone. We're not really human. Okay, well, you're an awesome man, and I'm thankful for you. And uh, I hope that you will do this again with me, and we'll keep learning together, and these people will get a chance to do it too. Thank all of you for listening and watching. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Larry.